Hola, amigos y amigas. My name is Delia Rees. I am an author and educator and the face behind Aventuras in ESL, which is a platform where I share diverse books focusing primarily on the Latinx, Latina, and Hispanic culture. Today, I have the honor of hosting an amazing author friend, Karina Nicole Gonzalez. She is the author of The Coqui Still Sing, which is available in English and Spanish, by the way. And she's going to be here joining me, chatting a little bit about her author life, the process about getting this book out there and maybe any future projects out there so join me as I invite her in and we're going to chat a little bit more about this book welcome Karina how are you and where are you joining us from I'm well I'm uh joining you from Brooklyn New York and it's so nice to see you Delia I know we met a couple of months ago gosh it feels like half a year ago already thinking about the summer but it's so nice to to chat with you today well, I'm so glad that you're here, Karina, and you're right. I feel like summer went by like in a flash, <laughs> even though it felt like just the other day that I got to see you and we were walking through Brooklyn on a summer day, and I'm sure it's now like chilly or getting a little bit colder over there. It's been freezing. We had to turn the heat on, which is just strange to do. It's technically, yeah, it's officially fall, but you know, October can still be kind of warm, so it's feeling very cold here in New York. <laughs> well, I'm looking forward to being back there sometime. Because um, last time that I saw you, we were barely discussing, hey, your book is about to be out, like counting down the days. And now, um, you know, your book is out, you know, um, it came out in August. And so I have a copy right here, The Koki mm -hmm. Still Sing. It's such a beautiful copy. I've been awaiting this release for so long and it's finally out in the world. So can you tell us a little bit about your debut day and did you have any jitters on that day? Oh, absolutely. <clears throat> I remember August 23rd, 2022. That's when the book was released. I was feeling really nervous and our you know, mutual friend and fellow author, Andrea Beatriz Arango, she sent me a message early in the morning and it was such a sweet loving message that it kind of set the tone for the day and i'm so thankful that, that she sent me that message and um yeah so basically uh the morning crystal and i we went to books of wonder and we signed some copies and of our book and then we celebrated afterwards we stumbled upon this like spanish tapas restaurant bar um, that happened to also sell churros and that's the theme of our next book and so it just felt very serendipitous that we found a spot right after signing our first book um, copies of our first book that we found a spot that sold churros and of course we sat and we had some and we had a drink to celebrate so it was a very beautiful day thinking back <laughs> on it. I love that it was such an eventful and like down to earth, but just fun, fun day to celebrate your book release. And I'm just so glad that this story exists. It's available in English and Spanish. The Spanish translation is done by Amparo Ortiz. Um, I've read the Spanish version as well, and it's so well done. Mm -hmm. So um, going back to the story, when did you first start working on it? And were there any scenes that you had to just cut out because of revisions? Oh, absolutely. I first started working on it. I had the seed of the idea shortly after Hurricane Maria happened. And, you know, I'm a bilingual speech language pathologist, so I work in the school system and I read picture books every day. Um, and so drawing on those experiences of reading so many picture books, I thought, you know, it would be really special and meaningful to write a picture book about Hurricane Maria. And, you know, around 2018, I began drafting a manuscript without knowing what I was doing, uh, how to pad properly paginate a manuscript. I had no clue. I went into it with cold feet. And um, if that's the, if I'm using that term correctly. <laughs> but uh, so yeah, I had really no experience writing manuscripts and it took a very long time revising it and getting it to a point where we could submit it. And eventually we were able to submit it. and. After um, a few rounds, um, the editors at Roaring Brook Press, uh, Luisa Berekiristain and Connie Shu really loved the story and they decided to present us with an offer. Um, so it was a multi-year process from idea to the final product. And yeah, there were scenes that I had to cut. I feel like writing about a traumatic experience like a hurricane 
it's very delicate because you want to strike a balance between conveying an honest depiction without causing the reader tremendous emotional anguish. So I, I felt that I was, I really had to navigate that properly. And there were, you know, lines or scenes that I had to cut that were a little bit too much on either side. So, so I, uh, so that was part of the process. So there were some scenes that were cut, um, but all for the better. The ma manuscript as it is, is just really well done. And I'm very proud that it's out in the world. And I second that too. Mm -hmm. I feel like the whole entire story is so well done. And you know, the illustrations enhance um, all your beautiful words throughout. Um, in this story, is there a particular scene that is just very close to your heart that you just really love going back and referencing? Absolutely. There's so many beautiful scenes. Crystal is so, Crystal Gila is the illustrator. She's so talented. And, you know, her illustrations were more than I could have imagined on my own. She really welcomed the story into her heart and made it her own. And and, you know, this journey is also our journey together as creatives. So there are so many scenes, but the scene that hits me the hardest and it always makes me emotional when I see it is the scene of Elena crying on her amaka because I feel we rarely see children uh, crying in picture books. I feel like it's rarely depicted. If anything, I feel like it's kind of taboo almost, which is an odd, way to approach it because children cry, we cry, it's a human experience, it's a human emotion. And I thought it was really important that um, that, that was also illustrated. I didn't ask Crystal to make sure that she you know, centered Elena in that spread crying, but she, but she did that on her own volition, on her own accord. And it was really moving the way she illustrated her. And I find that scene particularly powerful. Yeah, and it's a real life scene, like children have emotions. And I'm so glad that you depicted those emotions in this book. And throughout, there's so many beautiful scenes. Um, Crystal did an amazing job with all the colors. Mm -hmm. um, one of my favorite scenes is probably the one where she's eating a mango, like right away. <laughs> I think I love that one. Um, it's just such the vibrant colors and everything in the island just it's just a beautiful illustration, um, as well as all of them. I feel like Crystal did a really good job captivating your words into scenes throughout the whole story. So, Absolutely. And, and also after the hurricane, she muted the colors a lot, and which was real life experience. Puerto Rico is tropical. And after Maria, all of a sudden, the colors of the landscape were like brown and pastel. And that's what you see in her illustrations. That she did that so well. And um, yeah, I, I, I'm totally with you on that, that she really captured the essence of the text. Yeah, and going back to your text, I will say that the back of the book is super informational. This is probably one of the author's notes that I really appreciated. Like mm -hmm. I could probably print it out <laughs> because it's so um, informational, but like candy, like it's a really good resource guide because there's like a glossary page with like some of the Spanish text. There's information on Hurricane Maria. There's information on the Coquille Frog. There's photos of you, your family and Crystal's family. And then we also see like a call to action sheet at the end with several organizations that you listed. So this is, again, this is probably one of the best author notes that I've seen included in the back of a book. Mm -hmm. It's amazing um, everything that you included in the back that allows readers to dive in a little bit further past the picture book story. And, you know, recently Puerto Rico just went through another hurricane. And I'm so glad that there was a, like, a really handy resource guide in the back of this book, but are there any organizations that you think viewers, viewers can still donate to? And I can just link them to this recording. Absolutely, thank you so much, Dalia, for those kind words and that sentiment and for highlighting the fact that that is in the book and that is really important. And I thank my editors for allowing me to include that because when I began writing this, I thought immediately that's something that must be included. Um, picture books can be tools for social justice movements too. And I think maybe we don't always think about the power of picture books in that way, but I really do believe that they have a power. And it's just a matter of us, um, you know, 
figuring out how to um, wield that power, you know, how to cultivate that power and, and use it for good. Um, so there are multiple organizations that I have listed in the book, um, like Casa Pueblo, uh, Comedores Sociales, Taller Salud. Right now, a lot of those organizations are actually collecting donations and to help communities in need. And those are the three top ones that come to mind, but there's also others that I don't list, like Brigada Solidaria del Oeste, that's another one. There are so many. Um, it's just a matter of researching, and I hope that this list in the book can make it a little bit easier for people to have a starting point, a jump off point for, you know, um, wanting to learn more about organizations that are doing important work and, and maybe perhaps even donating to them. Yes, and I think you did such a great job of listing them here because, like I said, it's a really, really handy guide that we can reference. Um, when, no, when I was reading this book and, you know, unfortunately when the other hurricane that recently happened just happened, I thought of this book. I was like, Karina just like mentioned a ton of resources here and I will link her social media as well because she also shares all of these on her page as well. Um, but going back to a little bit about another component in your book, I mentioned that you have um, family photos in the back just as well as Krista included some as well. And I want to know a little bit about what does your family think of your book? When it came out, did you share it with them? What do they think about the story? Oh, they're an integral part of the story. You know, just even being able to write, really, right? That's my parents pushing me and making sure that I, you know, was, you know, that I focused on my academics. <laughs> so just my ability to write and read, I owe it tremendously to, to them. Um, and making that important growing up. Um, but more than that, you know, my parents sent me to stay with my grandmother in Bella Baja, Puerto Rico when I was a kid every summer. And that life there, as you know, Delia yeah, is so much different from life in the US. Everything from just like going to the store to, you know, living in the house, homes look different there. Everything felt different. And, and so a, a really important, uh, experience for me was reading the book with my grandmother for the first time. I had told her about the book. I don't know if she really conceptualized it when I explained it to her, but when I had the final product, the actual book, and I presented it to her, then I felt she really was able to understand what I was able to achieve and the story itself. And she could see pictures of herself at the end and you know, Crystal modeled the abuela in the story after my own abuela. So if you look closely at the spread um, that I mentioned earlier where Elena's crying, in the back, in the background, um, you can see the abuela in a pink bata <laughs> and um, black chancletas. And that's the same outfit that my grandmother has on in the author's note. You're right. Um, yeah, we see if that. I can zoom in a little bit. Yeah, that's okay. deliberate. That's not <laughs> you know, happenstance. That was Crystal really taking into account the pictures I shared with her and wanting to incorporate that, which was really special. So it was really meaningful to have my parents support, especially throughout the, you know, the whole journey and seeing them read it and the emotional response they had when they read it was one of the best things of my life. That's beautiful. I know you shared some of those pictures as well on your page. Um, they truly touched my heart just to see your grandmother holding the book and, you know, to see the grandmother in the story and then have um, your illustrator also include those images in here. I can just imagine how special that is and you know, your grandmother kind of seeing herself in the story as well. Absolutely. I, <laughs> she, she was like, oh my God, I didn't realize I had so much white hair. <laughs> <laughs> so she has a sense of humor about it, but she did, she did feel the weight of the story. And, and thank you so much, Delia, for, for asking me about that. Because, you know, I think, you know, in the Latino community, we think about our family a lot, but that's not a question I get asked much. And your family is integral and in storytelling, really. So they had a profound, especially my Ayala, had a profound impact on me and the story. I love that. And I mentioned earlier that the story is available in English and Spanish. And I love when books are available um, in Spanish as well, because I have like 
my obviously my collection of English books is way bigger but yeah. slowly I feel like more and more Spanish translations are coming out which I really appreciate and so I want to ask you why are stories like yours so important to tell I think we're seeing a shift right now in Kidlet where we're seeing more characters, characters from Latino America or uh, Black characters or Indigenous characters. We're seeing more of that, but I also want to see diversity of experiences of really centering um, children from diverse backgrounds, but also diverse experiences, like children from working class backgrounds. And I remember growing up, I never saw that depicted in a picture book. I never saw my culture. I never saw um, you know, class really depicted in a picture book. Not that it has to be done so explicitly, but there are ways that it can be done implicitly. And like, for example, a book that comes to mind that exemplifies that is Mi Papi Tiene Una Moto, My Papi Has a Motorcycle by Isabel Quintero. That book is, you know, for me, such, you know, a perfect example of the kind of books that I want to write that go a little bit deeper. They have a lot of layers and, so for me, what I want to do is I want to write stories that center children from diverse backgrounds and also diverse experiences, um, because that's the real world. You know, children, unfortunately, experience um, environmental disasters like this all around the world. My next book is about a family. Um, the mother is a street vendor. Many children have parents in the food industry world. These are common experiences and should be reflected in kidlet in general. Oh my gosh, I could clap like if I had <laughs> 10 hands right now. <laughs> clap to all of this because you just yeah. said it so beautifully. Um, going back to just the book example that you mentioned, my puppy has a motorcycle. Yes, mm -hmm. I feel like that one is a true sense of community and just joy within the community as well and doing something just, you know, as going in the forest riding in the back of a motorcycle with your dad like it's just a simple beautiful story yeah. and I think stories like yours um, are so important I'm so glad that this story exists and you just briefly talked about your next upcoming project as well and so that's kind of goes up into my next question is like what can readers expect more from you so you mentioned a book about um, food vendors is that a book that's coming out 2023 2024 what does that project look like that one is being illustrated right now by Crystal Quiles again. And that is slated to come out spring 2024, I believe. I think right around Mother's Day, um, which will be really timely. And it's just also a special story in a different way, but in an equally emotional way. Um, I think mm, working class parents, especially mothers or single parents are not often appreciated or they're kind of invisibilized by society and I wanted to write a book that put her at the front and as the magical heroes that you know guardians or parents really are and the sacrifices they make for us so that we can make it in this really cruel tough world so that's the that was the purpose Okay, so this this is why you're one of my favorite authors. Like you just condensed <laughs> it in the best way possible. And so well said, because that representation is so needed. And I'm so glad that you're gonna be highlighting that in your next project. I know for this book, the setting was like in Puerto Rico. Is the setting for this next book going to be in New York where you're at, or is the setting gonna take somewhere else? Uh, the setting is New York City, uh, New Union Square which, you know, if you've been to Union Square, there are some food vendors, but it's known more as like, um, there are a lot of more artisan vendors, people selling jewelry and things like that. Um, and I picked Union Square because it is somewhat circular in shape and it kind of ties in with the idea of, you know, circular community, people working in, in tandem and unison and, um, that, that feeling that you get when you're in Union Square. And so that's why I chose that setting. So it'll be different than cookies, but um, but nice as well. I'm like so excited <laughs> for this upcoming project. I love churros to begin with. Exactly. And I love the mission and the, you know, the theme behind this story that's upcoming. So let us know when the story is out so I can, you know, help pre like share out the pre-order link to everyone. 
Um, but Karina, this this has been super exciting. I'm so glad that this book is now out in the world. It is available where most bookstores, more, most books are sold, sorry. Um, but then you can also request it at your public library, which is what I tell people if you can't afford to buy it or if any other reason, you can also request it at your library so others can have access. Um, but before we head out, Karina, I want to play a quick little game with you called <laughs> Get to Know the Author, where I'm just going to ask you a series of fun fact questions so we yeah. can get to know you a little bit more. So are you ready to play? <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> All right, here we go. Um, what is your favorite music to dance to? Oh, that's a good question. I have to say, I mean, salsa is, uh, is the kind of music where it doesn't matter if you're from Latino America, it'll get you moving. Whether right. you're from Scandinavia or Japan, I mean, salsa is so popular and I've learned that salsa is so popular around the world. It's really amazing. It um, is. Yeah. I've seen so many salsa festivals all around. So, yeah. yes. <laughs> Next question. Do you prefer a quiet or a loud place to write? Oh man, I really admire people who can write with music on it. It sounds so cool. I can't. I, I, my, I don't have the multitasking brain. I think equipped that for for music and writing at the same time. So it's got to be quiet. Quiet all the way. <laughs> what is your favorite snack? My favorite snack. Well, when I come home, I usually grab like some Parmesan cheese and a couple crackers and just not not um nosh on those before I make dinner. That's my go-to. I don't know if it's that <laughs> healthy, but I like it. That's a good snack. <laughs> what is um, a place that you want to travel to? I've never been to La Ciudad de Mexico, Mexico City, which is, see, it feels crazy. I mean, it's one of the greatest cities of the world, and I know some people fi find it to be the greatest, so I've never been, and I really want to go maybe this year or the following, but I hope to go soon. Oh my gosh, that's so funny because that's where I want to go even though I have family in Mexico. Like I've never gone to Mexico City. Like I have a husband who's gone to Mexico City and yet I haven't. So I don't know. Now I'm going to call you up like, hey, yeah, Karina, vamos. Because yeah. <laughs> I haven't even gone either. <laughs> oh, I hear it's so magical, so beautiful. So let's do it. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. We'll put that in the plans. Yeah. Um, <laughs> next question. What is your favorite dish from Puerto Rico? That's a good question. There's so many, there's so many um, regional dishes throughout Puerto Rico too. I have to say, I love pasteles. Like the one thing I'll have from Puerto Rico, whether I'm there or not, are pasteles. So it, that must mean that it's my favorite dish. <laughs> um, but I do, I do like greasy stuff too. Like I've got purias once in a while, but if I had a favorite Puerto Rican food, it'd be pasteles. Oh, and that's you know, good. in Mexico, right? They're like tamales, they're not that much, distinct from what a pastel is in Puerto Rico so yeah it's very similar I, I've had conversations with my husband when I told him oh like when I first went to Puerto Rico I thought they were giving me a slice of cake because like we call it tamales and then pastel and Mexico is cake and I was like so confused I was like this is not cake I know, the <laughs> but it's so good yeah and then we call we call cake bizcocho Right. So we don't, I mean, you could say pastel, but we typically say piscocho more. It's all fun language yeah. and words. I love yeah. that. Last three questions. Cats or dogs? I have dogs all the way. I dogs. have never met a friendly cat. Uh, maybe one day I will, but I have yet to meet a friendly cat. <laughs> Team dogs on this Team one. Team dogs, yeah. Um, the last book that you read. Uh, the last book I read, I'll pick a kidlit book, if that's okay, a picture book, because I, I read mostly picture books, like, with work and stuff. I read this one that I really enjoyed, um, Sheep Count Flowers, recently. It's a really funky, unique book, uh, written by Michaela Chirif and illustrated by Amanda Mihangos. Uh, it's, like, a really cool take on the idea of, you know, we count sheep when we're going to bed. It's like a fun bedtime story and the illustrations are really unique and playful and inspired. And I, I recommend it for families who want like a really fresh take on a bedtime story. Oh, nice. I'm going to have to check out that wreck, especially if I'm struggling to fall asleep. Yeah. <laughs> 
And very last question, do you have any hidden talents? Ooh. So when I was a kid, I actually wanted to be a professional tennis player. That's a fun fact I usually like to share with, with my own students. Because they look at me and I'm, you know, I'm 4'11". I don't look like a, a typical athlete, but I really had aspirations to be professional. And I'm still pretty good, I'd like to imagine, at tennis, although I haven't played consistently. But, um, but yeah, even in, when I was younger, I'd be called Speedy Gonzalez. I was fast fast on the track, fast on the tennis court. So, um, so yeah, even though small, I'm small in stature, I, you know, I've got that athletic side in me. So there you go. Yeah. I love that. Hey, and you can still be a tennis player now. Like, yeah, <laughs> I'm rooting for you over here. Maybe like a small subset category, like Brooklyn woman over 30 or something. <laughs> I love that. Um, well, Karina, this has been so much fun. Um, where can readers purchase a book? Do you do any signed copies at your local indie or anything like that? Absolutely. Thank you. Um, you can find me. I'm on Twitter and on Instagram. My handle is at words by Karina. And I believe uh, many um, independent bookstores in New York City have signed copies of my book, like Books Are Magic, Books of Wonder, Word, uh, word is changed in bed -Stuy. and um, and yeah, if anyone wants to, you know, uh, get a, uh, figure out a signed copy, find one, I they can feel free to email me, uh, wordsbygarina at gmail.com, and I can find a, a signed copy for you somewhere. Oh, thank you so much. I will link all of those um, stores below too. So everyone can check that out. And as always, request it at your public library. And don't forget to leave a review because reviews help so much. So if you can leave a review on Goodreads and Amazon, that's super, super helpful. Um, pero Karina, this has been so much fun. Thank you so much for joining me. And thank you, everyone, for joining us in the special month celebrating Latina Latinx Hispanic culture. And Karina, muchísimas gracias. And I really, really hope to see you soon. Absolutely. Gracias a ti, Delia. You're phenomenal and I'm such a fan and thank you for amplifying um, all of our books on your platform. I really appreciate it.